We are in our third week of series on five keys to relationships that last. And this week you find us with key number three, resolving conflict and showing grace. And so our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. And it reads, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgive one another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in that one body, and be thankful. May God add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and the living of His Holy Word, especially the living part, as we engage into this series and we talk about resolving conflict, fighting fairly with those amongst us and those relationships that are closest to us. The earliest fight that I can remember my wife and I ever having was over which washer that we should purchase. We were a young couple. We had a solid, uh, you know, no money uh, to our name just starting out, but we started renting this little house uh, outside Fort Campbell, Kentucky, when her and I moved down there away from home, uh, away from our, our families kind of all together. And the first fight we ever had, uh, and I can picture Aaron in tears in the Home Depot, right outside Fort Camp, right outside Fort Campbell, as we argued about how much money to spend on which washer, and it just seemed that this decision and this conflict that we were going through was going to end our relationship right there at Home Depot and Lowe's, a solid two weeks into our marriage vows. But as we all know, we look back at these things and sometimes those fights, those disagreements we have are not near as important as we thought that they were at the time, especially when it was just about a washer and dryer. She may have a different opinion and revision of that story, but here we are to talk about sources of conflict within those relationships, friendships, and, and, and uh, marital relationships that are closest to us. And so in a survey recently completed by a partner church of ours, uh, where they actually surveyed 10,000 of their uh, members of their church, they asked all kinds of questions relating to uh, marital issues. And one of the questions they asked is, which of the following issues are a source of regular marital conflict? Now, of the top seven responses and, uh, that were shown by both men and women, what's interesting is that the top three for both men and women were all the same. And if you're out there thinking, well, I think money is number one, you would actually be wrong. Number one for both men and women for the sources of instability in their marital conflict are communication and failure to listen. Number two, again, same for men and women, is when they're when we're both tired and weary. And three, feeling unappreciated. That both men and women both claim that the failure to communicate reactions when you're both tired and weary and feeling unappreciated are the top three sources of marital conflict in their relationships. It starts to get a little different when you get down into four where men say uh, inattentiveness to their needs. And then women say, uh, an improper sharing of household responsibilities in there too. But interesting, and so I think we could probably go all the way down the list to 10, and you may have uh, a number of issues that uh, cause some instability or conflict within your relationships, but I almost think I only get 10, 15 minutes with you, even if we just focus on the top one. And that is our ability as couples to communicate with one another is probably the most important thing that we can focus on and both 52% of men says that it is the leading cause of conflict in their marriages and 56% of women say that communication and the failure to listen are the leading cause of conflict in their marriage. And uh, there are six words that may be as important as any spoken in any relationships, perhaps even more than I love you. And these six words are, I want you to write these down. I am sorry. <laughs> and I forgive you. And then before we even talk about communication, those things, we cannot think seriously about resolving conflict in marriage or any other close relationship until we recognize the reality that at times any two people will experience conflict and both possess the capacity and need to forgive one another. And that includes you and it includes me. So let me repeat the six words again. I am sorry and I forgive you. 
We get those down. A good place to start or study is Jesus, whose life was, was, was God's forgiveness, lived out in this world in human flesh. Because for Jesus, forgiveness was the fundamental reality of his kingdom. For one, if God did not forgive, no fallible human would ever have hope. Jesus also knew that it's simply not credible to claim God's forgiveness, one to ourselves, if we weren't willing to forgive others. One of my favorite quotes from William Barclay says, Forgive us our sins as we forget those who sin against us. And the Lord's Prayer is quite clear. And that if we say, I will never forgive so-and-so for what he or she has done to me, and then take this petition of the Lord's Prayer upon our lips, we are quite deliberately asking God not to to forgive us. To be forgiven, we must forgive, and that is the condition of forgiveness which only the power of Christ can enable us to fulfill. So point number one on communication is admitting the fact that you could be wrong in any given situation in this case, and to be open to listening to the needs of others. Going back to the first series when we talked about what it meant to be helper. Now, in understanding this, what I think many times, at least in my own relationship is, uh, speaking for myself, uh, sometimes I can't tell when my wife's mad. And sometimes I wish she would communicate more with me about what's bothering her. Or sometimes I might bear some kind of resentment for something I think my wife should or should not be doing. And then later, if I'm open to realizing that maybe even I'm a little bit at fault here, I might begin to think, well, did I ever communicate a clear expectation of my partner for why I'm upset? And oftentimes we can let that bitterness and resentment hold up within us without ever asking ourselves if we're humble enough to say, well, did I ever even talk to my spouse about this was something that I needed or I wanted from them? And sometimes we can just continue to go on in our relationships without ever communicating what our needs and expectations are for one another, and that we just let that resentment continue to build up, and then eventually one of us blows up and it turns into something that could have been easily resolved at the very beginning. Recently, when you go through ordination in the United Methodist Church, you go through a communications model where they teach and show us that generally people, com generally people communicate on six different levels, or what they call personality types. And these are thinkers, people who uh, are loved to be recognized for their work or their time structure, persisters who like recognition of work but really have strong convictions about things, harmonizers like me who like recognition of me as a person. We like when everybody gets along, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have folks who maybe are quieter folks who are imaginers who when uh, they like to go off and think about things on their own before coming to decisions or having conversations with people. We have rebels who enjoy playful contact with one another who might not mean any harm. And you may have a few of those in our family. My middle son is one of these. Or folks who are promoters we're very charismatic people and can talk just about anybody into anything. But the important thing to think is that uh, it's not for you to memorize the different types of personality types, but to realize that different kinds of people also undergo stress in very different ways. And then our first response in our relationships is that they fail because of our inability to communicate our clear expectations with one another about our needs and our wants and to sit down and do that, and that when we move into what we call degrees of distress, when we are tired or are weary, well, thinkers begin to overqualify things. They don't delegate, and they overcontrol other aspects of their life without including their partners. Persisters begin because they focus on their beliefs, begin to focus on what's wrong and pushing their beliefs instead of trying to come to some rational or, or coming to some kind of solution amicably between two people. Harmonizers who don't like conflict at all tend to overadapt, try to make more like their partners and forgive some of their selves and they hold up a lot of resentment with each, within, within themselves. They tend to make mistakes and they attract self-criticism. Imaginers who go like to think on their own will withdraw and passively wait for their partner to tell them but not clearly communicate their, uh, their needs for them. Rebels begin to invite others to do or think for them and blame other people, sometimes for their own poor choices. I say all of this to say, if communication and if when we are tired and weary are leading to the most amount of conflicts in our relationships, 
One, have you communicated your needs and wants with your partner clearly? And two, can you recognize when your partner is in some state of distress? And when you do notice it, do you attempt to sit down and not solve the problem, but do what we call active listening? And the intention of active listening is not to come into a conversation with a solution to the problem. And this is going to be hard for you thinkers and your persisters out there, but to come in and come with more questions to recognize this person and their unique needs in this situation and come with questions and value the questions in the situation that somebody is going through without offering up our own solutions. Asking God or people for forgiveness and accepting it starts with being honest ourselves on where we are within our relationships. And often our first challenge is to be honest with ourselves. Most of us are adept to rationalizing even our biggest failings. And we repeatedly see in the lives of our public figures, even if we know uh, we've missed the mark, we think that we can hide from others and oddly even enough from God, these things going on in our relationships. A psalmist wrote in keeping silent, trying to hide truth is draining him of his energy and his life. The choice is yours. You can continue to carry the burden of your sins, or you can allow the Lord to take it from you and set you free as he wants you to do. But the process begins with the acknowledgement of where we are. Do you find it hard to admit your mistakes and missteps before your partner or before God? And how do you see yourself at your deepest level in relationship to most others as less than as more than? And how can Jesus' image of God's forgiveness and love for the outcast tax collector help you more clearly see how he values you just as you are? Now, another interesting piece of the survey conducted by uh, our, our, our partner church was that amongst the people who said that I wish my partner would listen to me, and they compared that with how happy people said in their relationship that 49% of people who said that they were struggling or very unhappy in their relationship, almost half of those people said, I wish that my partner listened to me more. Whereas people who reported being very happy and satisfied in their relationship, only 11% reported having said that. But I think sometimes the hardest part about listening to another person is putting yourself aside and taking their challenges on on their own, especially if they're talking about us. Because sometimes facing our own faults and our own mistakes is perhaps the hardest thing we can do. But I would like to go back to the six most important words. I am sorry and I forgive you. Of other relationships who said, I wish my partner would share their thoughts and feelings of relationships who said that they were struggling or very unhappy, 43% of relationships said, I wish my partner would share with me more. Of those relationships who report being very happy, only 17% of those relationships say, I wish my mate would share their thoughts and feelings. It is almost parallel, as if to say that those relationships that communicate more, especially their thoughts and their feelings, and in mutual listening to one another, these relationships, by and large, almost 90% of them, claim that they are very happy and satisfied in their relationship. And so I know I may be touched on something that may be a sore subject going on in your house, maybe even today and in this week, but I'm not trying to meddle too much. But if only to say that if we are truly to take on Christ's will for us and our relationships, what we have to take seriously, our ability within the relationships closest to us to listen to one another, to be attentive to the needs of one another, knowing when one of us is going through some kind of stress uh, and, and knowing that, you know what, I needed to put a little bit more of myself aside in order to support my partner in these times. I wanted to ask as we close up this message that in your closest relationships, do you notice the ways that the differences between people bring in depth and richness and in strength, even when those relationships seem to surpass all of the challenges that they face? I shared a couple weeks ago in our in-person service that uh, we needed a, a clear mission, a clear mission, vision, and purpose for the marriage. And I wanted to give you this vision right here. That it wasn't too long ago I was visiting uh, an, an older woman who was 
uh, close to passing on and going home to be with the Lord. And I was sitting there and doing my normal pastor thing, and there was no family here. It was just me and her. And we were praying together, and I'd sang my couple songs that I like to sing when we're in the hospitals, or if somebody asks me to sing a song, and I'll do that. And then, uh, and you know, people are, are generally polite. If they didn't want me to be there, they'll at least be polite if I was there, and I'll know when it's my time uh, to go. Uh, but she was being generally polite by the fact that I was there, you know, not, neither here nor there, very neutral, I would say, about my presence until I thought I finished up this song, and I thought I just did so good because I saw her, you know, a, a woman so close to passing to the other side and so weary from the life and the struggle that she was going through, and I thought my song was just good, but I just saw her eyes light up, and I thought, oh man, I just did something really great. I'm glad I really nailed uh, how great thou art there for her until I turned around and realized that her husband was coming into the room and shuffling in with his walker as he came up, and you, I just faded to the background. And the gentleman came up and he grabbed her hand and he kissed her forehead and asked if he could take my seat. I said, of course, you can take my seat. You're the, you're the guy. I'm not the one that needs to be here right now. It's her best friend. And I see relationships like that and I can't help but know that that's exactly what I want and what God wants for all of us is that companion and helper through all of life's challenges. And sometimes those struggles that you're going through today seem so big, like they're going to encompass all of your life. But guess what? They're not. They're not. And as we shared in in-person worship a couple weeks ago, where relationships get the toughest between years uh, ten, between years five and twenty, when you start having kids and the demands of soccer practice and these other individuals come into your life, and 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 you fail to remember that you needed to set time aside for each other, that it doesn't stay like that. And that we have to continually make time for one another, and that includes listening to one another, being attentive to one of us to want to when one of us is not doing well, when we need to talk, when we need to listen, and when we need to be there for each other. 